Legacy Maker, the All Sports Network. Let's get this thing started. Welcome back to the Inner Out Sports Debate. We are in episode two. To my left is my man, Rob Johnson. I'm Drew Willingham here to bring you five of the most recent topics in sports and some of our opinions that we have along to go along with it. And then our first topic we have actually has to deal with sports and entertainment, something that uh, Rob and I both like to watch from time to time. Professional wrestling and the best professional wrestler of all time. AJ Styles, are you in or out, Rob? There are a lot of different layers to it. I'll just say real quick, there's the talking, there's the wrestling part. When it comes to wrestling, I believe AJ is in top 10. But I have to go out. <laughs> the best technical wrestler, if we're talking purely wrestling here, we're talking purely wrestling, correct? Okay. The best pure wrestler I've ever seen is Bret Hart. Uh, big AJ Styles fan. Um, I still think he has a lot of time. So that's the thing. He still has a lot of time to go. So once his career is over in five, ten years, whatever it may be, then we can discuss it. But still right now, the best type of wrestler I've ever seen is between Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. And I have to give it to Bret Hart because he went through the, the Stu Hart dungeon and all that. Yeah, and, and I have to agree with that, too. I'm out on this as well. I would have to say, in my opinion, and from watching a, a documentary recently, actually – uh, sparked my memory on some of these things. But if we were going to go best technical wrestler of all time, it's really close. But in my opinion, it's it's a heart, but it's not Brett. It's Owen. Like, Owen was phenomenal when it came to some of the things he was doing. I don't know if you've watched the uh, – I think it's the Beyond the Ring or whatnot documentary that was recently done on him. Yeah. Uh, when you get a chance, if you haven't, check that out. And for those of you fans out there, check that out. There were certain things within that documentary, things that you can't see really on the WWE network because they've kind of sheltered and, and put him in the background, kind of like Chris Benoit too, in a way, like you can't really find too much Owen stuff unless you go digging for it. And for obvious reasons. It, for, yeah. Benoit. Oh yeah. But yeah. you know, when you see the, the matches, especially that he had with Brett, those were some technical classics. Uh, some of the things that he did, you know, without Brett, he, he made certain guys have their, their best matches of all time. And those guys were searching for matches like that after they wrestled with Owen. My opinion is it's Owen Hart is the best technical wrestler of all time. But if we had to go with the most well-rounded wrestler of all time, between technical and mic skills, I'd, I'd have to say it's up there with Shawn Michaels or before he got hurt with the neck injury, you could say Stone Cold Steve Austin. The mm -hmm. Rock was phenomenal when it came to promos, and he, and he was a, a phenomenal talent in his prime, but I wouldn't put him up there as the best wrestler of all time. So no, no, why, no. That's why I have to say I'm out on AJ Styles being the, the best professional wrestler. And, 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 and just for the younger people as well, go back and watch uh, Stunning Steve Austin when he wrestled um, in WCW, United States champion, wrestled with Brian Pillman. He was a really good, good – he was a damn near perfect wrestler. Uh, so uh, Stone Cold made him, but before then, before the neck injury, he was one hell of a wrestler. No, most definitely. That's, that's why I have him up there. So, But when we shift to the next topic, we start talking about Major League Baseball. All-time dynasties, okay? How how do you think – how would you feel with the 1990 to 2005 Atlanta Braves, those 15 years – of that great team, would you consider them being the best dynasty of all time? Are you in or out on that? Well, this is why I'm a journalist and why I keep things honest. Yes, I'm an Atlanta Braves fan. I grew up in an Atlanta Braves fan. However, it is preposterous, it's ludicrous, and it's absolutely insulting to call them the best dynasty of all time. And I'm going to give you the reason why. <laughs> I went back and did some research because a lot of people know me as just a funny guy, you know, things like that. But I am truly an historian of sports. You know, before, you know, I, you know, a couple of years ago, um, but I'm, I'm getting back into that realm. And let's talk about one team, the 1947 to 1963 New York Yankees. In 16 seasons, 
They won 10 championships, appeared in 13 World Series. The only time they didn't appear was 1948 when the Indians played the Braves, um, 1954 when the Giants played the Indians, and 1959 when the Dodgers played the White Sox. During that time period, they won 1,631 games um, over that 16-year period. They averaged 102.1 wins per year. That's how many games they won. Um, so if you look at that time period, and if you look at 1947 through 1953, they won six out of seven championships. So to me, the 1947 Yankees to the 1963 Yankees in that time period, you want to space it out, they're the best dynasty, I believe, in the history of baseball. You know, that you, you bring a very good argument to, for someone to actually be out on this topic. And you know, it, you, you almost convinced me to go out on this, even though it already predetermined my answer with this, but I'm actually in. Woo! And I'll give you my answer why. I mean, it was very close. You know, your 16 seasons was with the Yankees. 1990 to 2005 is 16 seasons for the Atlanta Braves, technically, you know, if you, if you think about it that way. And an era where the ball was juiced with players taking performance-enhancing drugs, steroids. The long ball was was phenomenal back in the 90s and early 2000s, okay? And you have Maddox, and you have Glavin, and you have Smoltz, and then you have the other pitchers that helped them get to that 95 World Series victory like Wohlers before he got hurt. And then you look at the 91 team, and they should have won, you know, against the Minnesota Twins going to the seventh game. And then they went 98 against the Yankees. And then they went again, you know, the following – well, not the following year because it was the 99. 96. It was, remember, remember 96. And 96. So they, yeah, it, was 90, because, it was 96 yeah. and 98. So they, they went to four World Series in the 90s. Well, remember, okay. I think it was nine. I think it was nine nine two thousand. Because remember the the Padres. Ninety nine. Ninety nine was a Subway Series between the Mets and the Yankees. Yeah, I think I think it was I think it was I think it was two thousand because if you remember the Padres upset the Braves and the they went on to play the Yankees in that World Series that was just god awful. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. So yeah, but the I mean the Braves, they, even though they only won one World Series out of that sixteen year span, you know, you can say like you said the Yankees. But the Yankees were loaded, okay? You had Mantle, and you had DiMaggio, and you had, you know, Yogi Berra, and you had Garrick at the end of his career right before that, you know, and, and Ruth. Like, they've always had big-time players. Atlanta was known for being a very mediocre team that Ted Turner bought and then bought the, the TBS Superstation and then hosted Atlanta Braves games all across the United States to where when they were terrible, you still saw them. But in the 90s, when they had those three dominant pitchers, and then you have Jeff Blauser at shortstop, and you have Chipper Jones coming up, and you have all those other big-time players, and Klesko, and Javi Lopez, and all these guys that stuck around mm -hmm. for so long. Fred they, McGriff. And Fred McGriff, too, who they brought over from San Diego. Andrew they, Jones. Andrew Jones, for, and a lot of these guys that we named, like Klesko and Jones, and both Joneses, all of these guys came up from the farm system. So mm -hmm. they, they, they built a very strong farm system. This team, from start to where they got to, they should have had more World Series. They should, they, there's no excuse for it. They should have had more. Then you got David Justice, too, another name that pops to mind, too, that was a big, big for them in 95. Mm -hmm. They should have had more World Series, but then money and people juicing and all these other things got in the way. But people were juicing in the 80s. People were juicing in the early 90s all the way on until you had – the 1998 season where they had the home run season between Sosa and McGuire that brought baseball back from the strike that happened in 94. Can I say this, Drew? I mean, just, just like, just like the same things we see in society now, they've been going on in society for the last, I don't know how many hundreds of years, just like cheating and baseball has been going on forever. I mean, you can go back and talk about the balls or spitballs, things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of good points from you. But I'm hearing a lot of what ifs as well. <laughs> the Atlanta Braves, um, the, the Atlanta Braves had chances to win World Series. They didn't get it done. So guess what? You have one World Series championship. You had all that talent, and I understand it was a lot of young talent, a lot of farm system. But you had the talent. You had three dominant pitchers, and you still couldn't get it done. And you want to compare that to those 1947, 1963. Uh, New York Yankees who had to deal with not only the, the, the New York Giants, but the, the Dodgers who were always loaded. Then you had to deal with the Cleveland Indians who were powerhouses at that time. 
I, I can't agree with you here, Drew, but I love your sentiment, though. I'm hot to be out on this. But there's one big thing you also have to keep in mind, too, that during the era that you're talking about, there was no salary cap. That they could pay them whatever they wanted to, even though the money wasn't as big back then as it is now that what you're playing, paying players. They didn't really have salary caps back then. Well, this In is the one 90s, way we- the 90s is what started free agency and salary caps for multiple different, you know, organizations like NFL and MLB. Like a lot of that stuff started in the late 80s, early 90s. Well, there's only a couple of ways we're going to solve this question. When we get it, when when the people need to give a good comment, and I'm going to try to get this question to Tim Kirkson. Because Tim, I'm guaranteeing you, if Tim Kirkson sees this, sees this question, he's going to blast you. <laughs> Tim Kirkson will blast you. Low voice and Bring it on, Timmy. You. <laughs> yep. Bring it on, Timmy. <laughs> but now let's let's switch over to, to NASCAR with our next topic. And this one has to deal with, with Kyle Busch. And, and a lot of people you say a lot of different things about Kyle Busch. You love him. You hate him. But in NASCAR, he, he's been very, very big to this sport since he came in. Him and him and Kirk, both, Kirk, both Bush brothers really have. And this one, do you think that Kyle Busch will exceed 100 Xfinity race wins? This isn't the Cup Series. This is like the next oh, one know. down. The, the, well, this yeah. is, for, for our viewers, of course, but I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, where he's at right now, do you see him exceeding 100 Xfinity race victories before he retires? Well, and I shouldn't assume, but I'm pretty sure it's a lot of our, our viewers are NASCAR people, especially the last few days um or what have people been doing the research but um he's 35 he's been in the game now for 17 years uh he has 56 wins out of uh 546 races in nascar in the cup series however this is where it gets funny for me in 90 and now 355 races in xfinity he has 97 wins in the truck series he's got 58 wins 154 so he must really like the amateur stuff so at 97 wins i'm definitely sure he's going to get to 100 and probably more so for me, I'm definitely in big time on this. This is not even a question in my book. He's going to have 100 wins because, um, you know, he's um, he's an amateur guy right now. You know, he, he loves the amateurs. He loves taking advantage of the guys who just aren't that damn good. Woo! When I came up for the topic for this show, I was like, should I say 125? I didn't want to jinx the man because it's still quite a bit of quite a bit of wins away. He's 35. I am in on the fact that he will get to 100. I mean, he's only got to get to three more wins. Woo! But you also got to keep in mind that – Kyle Busch, I think he only does like four or five Xfinity races a year. So he doesn't do as many now because there's limitations. You, back in the day, you could race all weekend. You could do truck, Xfinity, and Cup the whole weekend. Now there's a lot more restrictions on it. And this happened before the pandemic this year. This has been going on for the past few years to where they've been limiting the drivers in what they can race because you've got to give the other guys, the younger guys that are the amateurs, more of a chance to be, you know, uh, you know, get top tens and, and top fives and, and victories to where we gotta it, make them. We gotta make them feel good. You know, exactly. We, 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 you know, we, we want to give them participation trophy. You know, we don't want to make them better by making them suffer defeat. <laughs> we want to coddle them and make them say, "I want to win too. I want to win too." Oh, uh, that's what's wrong with the society. Everybody wants to win, but nobody wants to put in the damn work. Got me fired <laughs> up, man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I, I think that, that he'll at least get to 115 wins, possibly. You know, it depends on how late into his 40s that he'll race. He's definitely going to get to 100 wins, so we're both in on that. But I'm now serious, the- Drew. I'm serious. You want to face the best. You want to be – excuse me again. <laughs> you want to face the best. You want to go against the best. So that's all I'm saying. But, yeah, next topic, man. I'm done with these, with these trophy – with these young trophy people. This next topic is um, it is a rough one. It is rough as the as the question is, with everything going on over the past couple of weeks, we've seen some serious things happen. You know, in in our life, you know, over the past couple of weeks and over the past mm-hmm. few months with the whole pandemic. But things have gone from bad to worse, and. Mm-hmm. Drew Brees happened to make a very insensitive type of uh, statement that most people know about. And do you think as a result of what he said, you know, even though he said it years ago before all this happened, 
And his way of defense this time was it was out of context, which he still shouldn't have said it at all. It was just totally wrong for him to say it, you know, especially Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think Drew Brees has a rough road ahead for the 2020 season based on his comments that he made recently? You know, I made some comments, made a few memes about Drew Brees, nothing intentional, nothing too harmful. Just was, you know, trying to point out that I didn't think his comment was um, important at this time. However, I think that if you look at Drew Brees and you look at the situation from last year, um, passing for nearly 3,000 yards and 27 touchdowns, four interceptions, and only um, 11 games of action, I believe that um, his team rallies around him. I believe that he makes concessions in the community, as he has done before. And I believe that in this year, 2020, 2021, I think Drew Brees breaks Peyton Manning's single season record of 5,477 yards and passes for 5,500 yards and has an outstanding season. Uh, He has Emmanuel Sanders now. He has a very underrated Maurice Harris coming from the Washington Redskins who was not utilized correctly. You still have the talent to tie in. So I think Drew Brees comes back strong. And I think he really does damage the NFL this year. So, I don't think it's going to be rough. I think he's already gone through the roughest periods. I think people realize there's bigger fish to fry than Drew Brees. So Rob is out. I'm out. I'm actually in on this one. Woo! Um, mm, mm. With with Drew Brees, you know, in in his 40s, you know, they've, they've been talking about the cliff for Tom Brady for so long now, and he hasn't really met it yet. We could actually see him actually really see the cliff for him this year. But let's st- let's stick on the Drew Brees topic. Based on the things that he said, even though he's very good at corralling that locker room together, there's still 31 other teams in the NFL, okay? Um, You can say whatever you want as an apology um, and and hide behind the veil of of what you've done in the past. Um, And it could always go and vice versa, things that you've done bad in the past, you try to do good things now. And it, it takes a lot more good to do now and in the future to wipe away a lot of that that negativity, although in Drew Brees' case, he's done a lot of good, and this is his first real slip-up, okay, as far as something coming out of context or he's saying something that could possibly be out of context, whether he meant it a certain way or he didn't. There's still 31 other teams in the NFL that may not forgive him and defensive players that need some type of fuel to motivate them to get to that next level to – get their team over the hump, okay? So there's going to be teams out there potentially of different cultural backgrounds, okay? Whether they're Hispanic, Caucasian and still take it a certain way, African-American, either one, they're going to take it as some type of motivation coming against him. Just like people were taking it as motivation when Colin Kaepernick was taking the knee into trying to find ways to get him out of the NFL, which was still wrong. They're going to use it in a similar light, but to go against him because nobody's going to kick Drew Brees out of the NFL. He's going to retire. And I feel like uh, that's why I can't hundred percent agree with, with your having a breakout season. I feel like he's going to get banged up this year and this is it for him. You've got Jameis as the backup. Jameis Winston comes in there. It could be a similar situation to the Teddy Bridgewater situation where Drew Brees gets hurt. Jameis comes in and then he gets to prove that he is an elite quarterback like Jameis has been talking about over the past couple of weeks. I feel like there's a very good chance that I don't think that Drew Brees gets hurt, but I don't think that there's a good reason. That I don't think he's going to play well enough to stick around after 2020. That's just my opinion mm-hmm. because of everything going on. I think, like, like I said, I believe that um, the New Orleans Saints, that they're going to rally and they're going to um, bring some heat this year that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Just warning people now. I was kind of out on the Saints a little bit coming into the season, and I really wasn't too in on them. But, you know – it's got a crazy feeling, man. Those Saints, I mean, you're motivated. You got Tom Brady in division. You got all these other good teams. I got a feeling that uh, Drew Brees is going to do some damage. So watch out for him. If he's going to, and I'll, I'll switch it up with this, even though I said that I'm, that I'm in on this one. If Drew Brees is going to have a phenomenal season, and he's going to get a Super Bowl or get to the Super Bowl again, this has to be it. This is. This is this is his chance to do it because Tom Brady is going to be trying to figure things out in, T- in Tampa Bay with different you know pieces around him. The only thing he's got familiar around him is Gronk. 
but you got a new coach. This is going to be a very learning curve type of season for them. I don't think that that means that Tom Brady is going to be done after this year. I think that he's going. To, they're going to have a decent year. They're not going to get as far as what everybody thinks that they're going to get. And then the following year, 2021, Tom Brady is going to have a light-up season, get them to the Super Bowl, potentially maybe win, and then he's going to hang it up. But if Drew Brees is going to get to the Super Bowl, and especially with Tom Brady in the, div- in the division, he's got to do it this year. And that's why both of us are, are against each other on this one, and we have different views on this. So it's going to be very interesting to see how 2020 pans out for the New Orleans Saints. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And when you, you know, when you take all that and you take about things that could potentially hurt the team, we can switch it up to this final topic here. You know, the NBA, with everything going on, they were the one big sport that was really playing, you know, at full speed when this pandemic came in. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, the, it, that's that was what was affected the most. I mean, you had NHL and you had, you know, other teams, college basketball and stuff that got shut down from it. But the biggest one that really got affected from this was the NBA. And now that they have a plan in place to restart the season here very shortly, um, there's there's players that are speaking out against coming back. And out of a very big team in the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, a team that a lot of people had picked to go very far this year, potentially the NBA Finals, potentially winning it all. Mm-hmm. Dwight Howard has been a very big part of that team this year, even though his first go around in Los Angeles wasn't that great. And he was shipped out of there as fast as he came in. But now because of this whole coronavirus pandemic and everything going out there with all the injustices that are going on out there, Dwight Howard is possibly going to be absent for the remainder of the NBA season for the Lakers. Do you think that hurts the team? Um, I'm out on that because I don't think he's going to miss it. I mean, I mean, there's a bottom line to this, and I'll keep it short. Yes, he's from Atlanta. Yes, there are things going on in Atlanta right now that are absolutely crazy, you know, from a social injustice standpoint. But um, I don't think anybody's going to be out. And I'll say this, and I'll, and I'll echo Patrick Beverly. If LeBron says they're playing, everybody's playing. If LeBron says we're not playing, there will be no NBA. So I have to be out on this. I think he'll play. He's going to play. I mean, the man is a Hall of Fame player who's searching for his first championship. This is his best chance to get a title. So I'm, I'm, out, on, I'm out on that. Unless LeBron says that, that, that um, he doesn't want to play, then everybody's playing. As I, Like I said before, what Patrick Beverly said. Because LeBron is basically the leader of this league. So that's, that's all I have to say about that one. It's pretty, pretty simple and easy to me. You know, if, if, if he actually does miss – you know, time and and sits out the remainder of the season. I'm going to say he, that there's an, I'm going to say that I'm in. Okay. Because when it comes to the first year that LeBron was in LA, you could tell that, you know, because he got hurt and everything, he had to carry that load so much like he did in Cleveland. And he did Mm -hmm. it for the past four years in Cleveland. By the time he got to LA and he tried to do it again, you could see that it wore him down and he, you know, he got hurt and didn't make a recovery for that season and was done until this year. This year, you know, he finally gets some pieces around him. He's got AD. He's got, you know, he's got Howard coming off the bench. You've got other players, too, that are there to help him out. And Howard's actually been very, very big when it comes to the battle of the boards and defense and stuff for this team this year. You know, I don't, I don't disagree with the reasoning of why he would want to sit out. But it's like you had just previously mentioned. This is your probably best chance to get an NBA championship, okay? Yeah. You know, not, not Anthony Davis. I mean, he's still got a lot of years ahead of him. But Dwight Howard in general on this team because he is one of the big time veterans along with LeBron on there. LeBron's already got three rings. If he had to retire next year, it wouldn't make a difference. He's already pretty much cemented his legacy for the most part and has got three rings. It's not like he needs any more. He does to be in that topic of with Jordan, but for Dwight Howard, where you were the big man in Orlando and you go to LA and it didn't work out and you're in Atlanta and you're going to different other teams in Washington and all these, you've been shipped he around. Did, he, yeah. However, he, however, he did get Houston to a, a, a Western conference final uh, when James Harden was struggling. Let's just put that out. But he didn't do it by himself. I mean, he's. Did, did, didn't he, do it by himself, but didn't do it by himself. However, um, we, 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 you know, he, he did a good job while he was in Houston. The whole LA thing just didn't work out. But to get back to what you were saying, the way I feel is, yes, if he does sit out, it will hurt. It will hurt him. However, 
I guess, like, the question is almost like, do we even feel like he'll sit out? I mean, I don't even think he'll even sit out. I think that's, that should be even a bigger in or out. Will he sit out? I don't think so. Now, if he played, let's say, for the Wizards right now, yes, he would definitely sit out. But I think the biggest thing right now is he has a chance to win a championship, you know, and he can go back to land in the offseason and really do some social injustice work. But this is a business, and you don't want to squander your best chance in 10 years plus to win a championship. I mean, I understand the social issues going on right now, but you've got to – this is a business. Like I said before, it's a business, and you want that championship to really cement your legacy. He's a big part of the team. Um, and like I said, I just don't see him sitting out. It just it doesn't make it wouldn't make any sense. And for Kyrie Irving, of course he's gonna sit out. I mean, he's injured anyway. I mean, I think Kyrie Irving would play right now if the Nets had Kevin Durant. Let's just be honest. And I hate to be, you know, cynical when I say that, but let's just keep it funky all the way real, all the way funky. If I mean Kevin Durant, Kevin, Durant, Kevin Durant should be Kevin Durant should be Kevin Durant should be healthy by now. He's been out for over a year and it, it is I mean, he, I mean, he's like been 10, healthy. twelve months for recovery. He, he he's been healthy, but that with that Achilles and then when you're coming to this coronavirus type situation and all that you save him for next year you, you don't rush him back but i'm saying if everybody was healthy Kyrie would be playing so my thing is to all my message to not only the white house but all the mid players if you're going to sit out then your team shouldn't doesn't have the, the the then your team doesn't really um um stick in the conversation of playing in the playoffs but if you're a team that's in the conversation there's no way you should be sitting out period and, and so i'm you, out i'm so i'm out i'm out you're out. I'm in. But, you know, you brought up one big thing with that is, you know, that I touched up with the last thing that I said was, you know, very good chance that this could be his one real opportunity to get a ring. However, if Dwight Howard has plans to play past this season as well, he could pretend and you're talking about squandering, you know, depending on what his role is in the social injustice and the protests and everything, depending on how his demeanor is through that this could squander him potentially playing after this season too, because a lot like Carmelo Anthony, who barely got a chance to play with Portland this year, a lot of people were kind of, you know, scoffing at the fact of bringing in Dwight Howard. It was LeBron who had to convince the ownership and the management that Dwight Howard deserves one more chance. If you look back into when Dwight Howard was brought into this team, it was very similar to how, you know, the Carmelo Anthony situation went down. But Dwight Howard does have a lot more to offer a team right now than what Carmelo can because he can play well defensively when he turns it on. So yeah. I'm, going, I'm going with the fact that I'm in on this. If he does end up missing time, right now it's just – a lot of hogwash with all the talking, but we'll see how it pans out over the next couple of weeks before we actually see the reboot of the 2019, 2020 NBA and, season. And, and, let, and, and let me say, let me say real quick, just really quick. I agree. If he doesn't play, it hurts them. I'm in on that. But I, the reason I'm saying out is because I just think it's just talk. He's going to play. Uh, and, and I hope so too, because you know, that, that, uh, that post that, that, you know, and I got to give a shout out to our guy, you know, with the Legacy Maker Sports Network with, with Cody Stewart, who's come in and done a lot of awesome work with the graphics here lately. You know, he put out that one, you know, very recently about, um, you know, your phone battery percentage and who would who, that would be your team to win or whatnot. And mine was at like 77% and I had the Lakers. I'm like, yeah, that, we, we, need, we need Dwight Howard to be on that team if my battery life is going to dictate how they end up this season. So we'll see how that goes. But, okay. but um, you know, this has definitely been a fun show. Guys, as always, just like in the first episode where we told you about, um, you can check us out on the Legacy Maker Sports Network at, on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We will have uh, shows uploaded to our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. You can also find us on Instagram, on Twitter, and uh, in other social media platforms. Stick, stick around for the very end of this episode where I'll have a list of um, Rob's um, social media information as well as my own and the Legacy Maker where you could find everything involving all of us in the network. For Rob Johnson on my left, I'm Drew Willingham. Thank you as always for tuning in.
Legacy Maker, the All Sports Network. Brought to you in part by dwillymedia.com.